The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, Training Specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, or the APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Forensic Accounting, APS Program Panel Discussion, with Carmen Castaneda, Stephanie Edwards, Ariel Finney, and Tracy Lee. And they are going to be introducing themselves in just a moment. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to run through some background and housekeeping. This webinar is the second in a two-part webinar series for ACL APS formula grant recipients on the topic of forensic accounting. We'll be hearing from four different states and or counties on how and why they have integrated forensic accounting accountants or tools into their programs, including some of the case outcomes. Next slide. Before we get started, I would like to share a little bit of, next slide please. There we go, thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and is administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Opinions expressed by presenters of county or local APS programs are those of the individual locale and do not reflect the opinion of the Greater State Program or the Administration for Community Living. Next slide. The APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. We are here to help APS programs in any way we can. So just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. And here is a slide on our peer-to-peer -peer calls. The APS TARC presents monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues that are facing your APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of the month, depending on which peer group you would like to attend. And registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and you would like to receive this registration. Next slide. And now some housekeeping. A handout of today's slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel and you can download them at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Please make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired volume. If you experience audio problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out of the webinar and log back in. Next slide, please. We are planning to have time for questions at the end of the panel discussion, and, and um, but you can submit your questions at any time by questioning them by typing them into the questions box in your webinar control panel, and we will try to get to as many as possible. This presentation is being recorded and it'll be posted to Huddle and the APAS TARC website at a later date along with the copy of the slides. And we'll let everybody know when those things are available. And finally, everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And also make sure you take um, the survey, uh, the webinar survey. We'd love to hear from you and get your feedback. All right, next slide. So while um, our presenters are presenting and introducing themselves, I'm gonna ask you a question and have you use your um, questions box for that. What are you hoping to learn from this webinar? So while you are typing that into the question box, next slide, we are gonna have um, our panelists introduce themselves. So Carmen, let's start with you. Well, good afternoon and thank you to APS TARC for inviting me to be part of today's webinar on forensic accounting. I'm Carmen Castaneda, and I'm the Program Manager of Hennepin County Adult Protection Services in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hennepin County is a state-supervised and county-administered program of which I've been Program Manager for over 30 years. I've been a member of NAPSA as well since the late 1980s, and I've served on its Board of Directors for the past 15 years as one of the regional representatives for the eight central states. 
Uh, Minnesota has a vulnerable adult law that provides investigations and protective services to persons 18 years and over with disabilities or older adults who have experienced abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. Our APS program has 35 employees and serves a population of 1.2 million residents. We receive approximately 10,000 maltreatment reports per year with financial exploitation ranking second in prevalence with self-neglect being the highest. Thank you, Carmen. And Stephanie. Hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Edwards. Um, I am an adult protective services worker uh, slash family services specialist three, which is the lead worker in the APS unit with York Pocosin Social Services in Yorktown, Virginia. I also serve as the EMDT coordinator for the Peninsula Elder Abuse Forensic Center. Great, thanks Stephanie and Ariel. Hello everyone, my name is Ariel Finney. I am the Adult Protective Services Policy and Legislative Program Manager for Washington State. Um, I have been in this role for about a year and a half and I've also been a statewide trainer and then also a supervisor and investigator. Um, and that experience certainly helps me in my job today. Um, I do manage both the policy and our legislative work and administrative rules uh, for Washington State, along with um, my executive leadership team here. I'm happy to be here presenting for everyone today. Great. Thank you, Ariel. And Tracy. Good afternoon. Uh, we appreciate TARC including us in this webinar today and welcome everybody. My name is Tracy Lee. I am a program administrator for the Division of Aging and Adult Services and Adult Protective Services um, within the Utah Department of Human Services. I have worked um, within the division for the last six years um, in a couple of different roles as an administrator. We are a state-ran system and financial exploitation, sadly, uh, eight years running now has been the highest allegation that we investigate in the state of Utah. So we have some specific initiatives that are really focused on reducing the prevalence of financial exploitation and improving outcomes for older adults and those with disabilities. Great. Thanks, Tracy. And just to cover a few things um, that have come in about what folks are hoping to get um, out of this webinar today is to get more information on how to set up forensic accountants uh, using grant funding, new ideas on how to utilize forensic accountants in our program, best format for organizing information, and um, we know we need assistance with our more complex financial exploitation cases and just learning how um, to use forensic accountants. So I think, thank you so much for those folks that sent those, um, those comments in. And I think we are going to be hitting on those points. Um, next slide. So we're going to be doing a round robin panel discussion and we have developed a few questions and then we definitely um, want to hear from, from you all as well. So panel question number one, how do you use forensic accounting or accountants in your APS program? And let's go ahead and start with Carmen. Okay. Well, I have to give a disclaimer right off the bat because um, Hennepin County is a county administered program and therefore some of the services that we offer through our contract are not necessarily required in the statute nor by um, the Minnesota Department of, uh, of Human Services, Adult Protection Services. So I, I have to make clear that we're, um, we, don't, we have a duty to investigate and to coordinate with law enforcement within the limits of our resources and expertise and to investigate allegations of financial exploitation until we make a final determination. But we are not required to exceed the preponderance requirement in our investigations in our, uh, in our evidentiary standards. So our responsibility is to coordinate with law enforcement, but law enforcement is the primary uh, investigative agency for criminal investigations in Minnesota. And therefore, we're not necessarily going to use our financial uh, our accountants to try to establish evidence to the uh, beyond a reasonable doubt standard. So I just want to make it clear that APS is a, is a social service program that we prioritize our activities on screening, assessment, engagement, safety planning, and service interventions. And our role is to connect those facing abuse to a variety of services and empower them to recover from maltreatment. So Hennepin County's contract with the forensic accounting firm is just one additional tool to help us enhance protective services. And therefore, it, it relates only to Hennepin County. So forensic accounting services in Hennepin County Adult Protection are used to assist in the investigation of financial exploitation cases, generally that involve criminal elements 
of fraud, theft, swindle, or undue influence of a vulnerable adult. And generally we use it when we're working in conjointly with law enforcement. Um, our purpose in working with Ide Bailey, who is the contractor with whom we uh, sign up with, is to reconstruct past events using financial information that assists our staff in substantiating financial exploitation so that we can confirm with objective evidence that the actions of the persons that we're investigating, they really did commit the maltreatment. In other words, you know, is this perpetrator really the one who committed the reported facts, acts of financial exploitation? So our adult protection objective is to stop the financial exploitation, to protect the vulnerable adult from further maltreatment, and possibly to recoup assets if possible. In some of these cases, I'd Bailey's findings assists us in upholding our, our final determinations too when we get appealed by the perpetrator on our substantiated findings. And as many of you with perpetrator registries know, these appeal hearings can be very challenging and time consuming for our APS investigators. So it all starts, um, with a referral to our forensic accounting contract with Ide Bailey that's reviewed by the program manager, and that's me, because we try to determine, do we really need this high level of expertise, or could we perform these actions ourselves using our newly purchased software program called ScanWriter? So if we okay it going to uh, Ide Bailey, then here's some of the criteria for when we use them. Generally on complex cases involving numerous bank accounts, stocks, bonds, real estate, taxes, loan applications, et cetera, that require you know, uh, accounting expertise. Also assistance in locating unknown or moved assets. And here's the main one that's a big one for all of us. And that's that we have limited time and staffing issues when we have large amounts of data that are just too extensive for our APS staff to manually enter. We're also looking for patterns of unusual spending for the vulnerable adult purchases that don't comport with the lifestyle of the vulnerable adult. We want to take a look at ATM transactions and withdrawals. We want to look at signatures and forged signatures. And of course, we want to contrast the spending before and after the allegation of financial exploitation. In some cases, we need uh, help for um, to support litigation and economic damage calculations to figure those out. So after we make referral to Ide Bailey, um, and they accept it. Then I Bailey prepares a statement of work for us. And the statement of work includes the project start and completion dates. It includes the scope of the work, which tells what they're gonna do for us, what they're gonna identify, what they're gonna need from us. Um, they also conduct a conflicts check to make sure that the uh, vulnerable adult and the perpetrator are not already clients of their agency. Um, and then they give us an estimate of the hours and the people who will be conducting the work there. They give us an estimate of the fees and other expenses. And um, then um, we sign that. Our average case runs between $4,000 to $5,000 per occurrence. But we've had several recently that have been so complex that I've set a, a not to exceed limit of $10,000 on each case. And again, we're not working this up to the standards of beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal prosecution, even though we're working with law enforcement in the county attorney's office. What I wanna stress are the significant benefits of using a forensic accountant. Number one is that it increases law enforcement's willingness to accept these complex cases, knowing that they will have a professional accounting assistance firm to, to work with them. Most police officers don't have accounting skills. They don't find these cases exciting and they will tend to redline them that they'll turn them down if they have to work it up themselves. Second of all, a forensic accountant speeds up the time it takes to put together the case for charging, which better protects the vulnerable adult and stops or reduces the financial exploitation. And finally, it strengthens the case for prosecution through the production of additional evidence when criminal prosecution is needed to protect the vulnerable adult. Wow, thank you, Carmen. That you touched on a couple of things that came up in the October twenty sixth um, webinar around um, if if it if using a forensic accountant actually helps um, or encourages law enforcement investigations and prosecutions. So that was one question that had come up. So thank it's you. Really good. Thank you so much. Um, so Stephanie, can you talk about how um, how your county uses uh, forensic accounting and her accountants? Sure. Um, our APS unit utilizes the forensic accountant uh, from our enhanced MDT. So um, I am the EMDT coordinator. And so the referrals would come through me and we utilize our forensic accountant for complex cases of alleged financial exploitation, which would be, um, you know, cases that have multiple bank accounts, um, lots of 
withdrawals, uh, wire transfers, checks, some investment accounts, things of that nature. Um, so we, we use him for those. So he reviews and analyzes the bank records and determines if financial exploitation has occurred. He completes a report for the APS worker who has requested that the case be reviewed. And then he makes recommendations regarding legal and or financial solutions to stop the exploitation. He will often recommend uh, that a POA be revoked um, or have other estate planning options or recommend conservatorship. Uh, most recently, we used him in a slightly different capacity than we normally would. I recently had a case in which I had a woman who was involved in a very, very complex lottery scam that spanned several months and she took out a lot of loans um, to the tune of 82,000. She lost 200,000 but took out loans of 82,000. So I had him make a home visit with me to this woman and he did a debt analysis um, consultation and he made recommendations of a reverse mortgage or bankruptcy. And I'd actually talked to a civil attorney as well about the case and the civil attorney had also recommended bankruptcy. So our forensic accountant, um, while he is a certified fraud examiner, his uh, job uh, in the real world is he has his own financial planning business. So he's a certified financial planner. So he was able to utilize that knowledge of financial planning to come up with those solutions for the woman uh, because her, because the, she's not going to be able to recover any funds. Um, her case was actually reviewed by the U.S. Treasury and they said because cash was primarily cash um, transactions, they would not be able to do anything about that. So he was just trying to help her find the best way out of debt. Um, so that, that was a, a new and innovative way of using him. Great, thank you. And then I remind me, I, I seem to believe that you had some exciting news when we met with our tech check around um, around the MDT. And was it related to forensic accounting? I'm 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 forgetting. Yes, it was specifically related to forensic accounting. Um, we received a three hundred thousand dollar grant from um, the. Uh, Department of Justice. So I was going to talk about that in question two. Oh so my goodness, I stole your thunder. I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. We look forward to hearing about that. Um, Ariel. All right. Well, Washington State's been very uh, lucky, I guess, to have multiple forensic accountants that we have access to. We do um, use our forensic accountants through contracted services. Um, so we contract with either the an individual or with their business uh, to provide forensic accounting um, reviews or consulting for our investigations. Um, with that, you know, because we're working with different contractors, there's sometimes a little different flavor on what, what areas that they cover or when we'll tap into a specific contractor versus another contractor. Um, but we're thankful to have options. Um, and that's one of the things that I um, think that we're, we're very lucky again to have. Um, we access forensic accountants really for those complex financial cases that come up, um, as others have already mentioned, where we're having, you know, a lot of activity in accounts or we're dealing with multiple accounts. Um, oftentimes, too, we might have uh, money being transferred between maybe, you know, our alleged victim's account to our alleged perpetrator's account to maybe some other accounts. We're trying to chase this money around. And um, while our investigators do a great job of really navigating a lot of these complex situations, it does take a ton of time and resources for somebody to really sit down and map that out and be able to take that information and produce a product that we can use to um, as evidence in our investigation and later on in due process uh, for our, um, our perpetrators in those cases. 
uh, what we really appreciate about these forensic accountants is that they're able to kind of take all this information and put it into a report that is more um, tangible for us to be able to really look at and go, hey, here's here are our concerns. Out of potentially thousands of pages of records, these are the things that we're going to focus on. Um, and that, that's really helpful for us to, to be able to um, you know, either build a case or be able to prove that nothing's going on, uh, depending on which way it's going. So we're, we're very thankful for that. The other thing that our forensic accountants can do um, is provide expert witness testimony, uh, again, depending on their contract and how we've written that. Uh, but we can um, use them as a witness when they've produced a document for us and kind of gone through the um, the accounting, uh, we might be able to call them as a witness in our hearing process. And that's really helpful to have a forensic accountant there kind of testifying to the things that they've discovered um, on our behalf. So it's really helpful for us um, and it helps us kind of navigate these cases that just take up a lot of resources and a lot of time um, and sometimes really require that, you know, accountant perspective of, of you know, chasing it down, you know, kind of finding that trail and following it through all the different accounts or investments um, or, or transfers of assets. Um, they can be really helpful for us. Um, and again, we try and use them really for those complex cases uh, that we really need that extra, you know, set of expertise on. Great. Thanks, Ariel. And Tracy. Okay. Utah APS has two sides of forensic accounting. We have an internal forensic accountant that is our, our baseline for our investigators to go to, to staff cases with, to seek advice on, to help look up records. Um, and our internal forensic accountant also serves as a gateway to our contracted uh, forensic accounting firm, which is I'd Bailey um, received a, a bid in the state of Utah. So our internal auditor screens cases. She keeps some of the more simpler cases that aren't complex, that don't have multiple accounts, that might be straightforward. She serves as a guide and mentor to our investigators and helps them. And then she also reviews any case that we are looking at su supporting. In our state, it's called su uh, supporting. I know nationwide, it's typically called substantiating. She reviews those, makes sure the documents are in line, and then keeps them in, um, make sure the evidence backs up the documentation um, to support a case. Then, as she screens cases, we were very fortunate. We met with the state of New York, who received a grant a few years ago, and they developed what's called the Feist Project. Um, and they developed some great paperwork and some tools that helped investigators gather the needed information to review financial cases. So we took their tools with their permission and we adapted them to Utah. And we now have implemented a similar program in which our investigators use the FICE documents to gather that initial information. And when it's identified that a case is really complex, our internal auditor will review it. And then we will send over the required documentation to Ide Bailey for forensic review. Um, as I mentioned, they review some of these more complex cases where multiple counts are involved or real estate or property or assets. And they provide us a report and send that report back to us. And then our internal forensic auditor meets with the investigator and the investigator supervisor. They review the report together and they decide if there is enough evidence to support the case based on our statutory requirements. The other way which we use forensic accountants is we do have both our internal and our external uh, I Bailey attend our multidisciplinary teams. We have several throughout our state. So we have split up the duties between the two of them and they attend and serve as support to our uh, various multidisciplinary teams. And I will talk more in the next question about how we fund that and some of our outcomes. Great, uh, next slide please. And Tracy, I was going to have you go ahead and roll right into that, um, if you oh. wouldn't mind. So how did you select the accountant and the process, and how is it funded? Great. So in 2015, uh, because financial exploitation was growing in the state of Utah, the, the agency made a legislative request, which then funded one FTE to hire our internal forensic accountant. Um, so that is paid with state dollars. 
The contract that we have with Ide Bailey is funded through a grant through the Administration on Community Living, and we received, we're, in 2019, we were the recipients of an enhancement grant. And our focus of that grant is to enhance financial, um, to prevent financial exploitation from occurring and to improve outcomes. So we are both state funded for our internal and then grant funded for our external uh, contracting process um, with Ide Bailey. Uh, today, just to kind of give people how that works, uh, just to give them a little snapshot of how we work. So far, externally, we have referred over 18 cases to Ide Bailey, and this was last month, so this doesn't include this month. Uh, and we supported 13 of those cases, um, and the proven loss that they were able to identify in their reports to, um, for victims of these cases was 1555000 and we spent in that first year on those cases about $55,000 for um, those findings to support our victims and to support our cases. And that also includes uh, paying for their administrative time to attend our MVTs. So that kind of gives you a snapshot of the costs and how many we referred over and what we've been able to prove. Great, thank you. There's nothing like some real tangible numbers to go with, with that. Um, Stephanie, because I can't wait. How did you select the accountant and process and how is it funded? Okay, so um, I was just really lucky, actually. I met our forensic accountant at our local task force on aging meeting. I had presented at that meeting on the formation of our enhanced MDT and he approached me after the meeting and volunteered his services. And uh, we would pay him if grant funding was available. We did in the beginning get some very small local grants. Uh, I know we had a $3,000 grant, a $5,000 grant, and then we had nothing <laughs> for a very long time. And this gentleman is just so passionate about helping older adults that he just, when we don't have money, just volunteers and just does it on his own, um, which is fantastic. Um, however, um, in October of this year, we were awarded a federal grant from the Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime, specifically for providing trauma-informed services to older adult victims of financial exploitation. And it is funded uh, for $300,000 for three years with the focus, like I said, being on financial exploitation. Um, so our forensic accountant is going to be paid to continue his review and his analysis of bank records, provide recommendations like he always has. And we're budgeted I mean, we have other things in the budget. The whole 300,000 is not just for him, it's for other things as well. But um, we anticipate him looking at um, possibly 10 cases throughout the year, maybe more, uh, eat, like 10 cases each year, but maybe more. Um, the other thing he is going to do is he is going to go to independent senior living com communities and some assisted living facilities and senior centers uh, throughout the Virginia Peninsula, which is approximately um, three cities and four counties. And he is going to make presentate fraud education presentations there. And part of our grant is to measure the effectiveness of his presentation um, as far as the participant's ability to recognize a fraud or a scam. So uh, we're really looking forward to that as well, that piece as well. Great, thank you and congratulations. Uh, Ariel, hey. yeah, no problem, Ariel. All right, it's great to hear of so many great things happening there. That That's wonderful. Um, for Washington State, we've been um, really just kind of doing research on different people who have that forensic accountant background or who can, you know, 
offer that that um, expertise that we're looking for. Again, we have different contractors with a little different background, um, but we are uh, largely finding them based through our own research and then reaching out and kind of uh, connecting with them and seeing if they're interested in contracting. One of the um, you know, challenges we face in Washington State is that, you know, we're not necessarily giving the same amount of cases each month to the forensic accountant. So it's one of those things where we kind of have to, you know, discuss the workload, discuss that kind of ebb and flow that comes with our referrals, um, make sure that they have the ability to handle referrals, and then also work with them on how many would be, you know, where, you know, how many would be too many, um, where would they want to stop there. We have had times where because we've been sending so many, our contractors have been able to hire more staff and meet that need for us uh, which has been great and then other times you know we have contractors who decline the referral uh, but we've really um, found these contractors just kind of through our own research um, with our our teams uh, throughout the state um, just kind of trying to build those connections um, we like to find contractors as much as possible that can work in certain areas of our state because we're a state-run program um, we do have some contracts that are you know kind of designed to handle referrals from across the state, uh, but we do try to find um, contractors who are in areas that, you know, are, are close to our office that really we can start building that relationship between the local offices and that contractor. It just kind of helps us, you know, not only um, keep that relationship going with our contractor, but also that contractor is a bit more familiar with the community in which they're reviewing documents. Um, of course, we always have to look for conflict of interest in that situation, but they're going to kind of know, like, does this make sense based off of this location? We're going to have that kind of inside knowledge a bit more. So we do our best to try and find contractors um, that can um, best serve the communities that we're looking to to serve. Uh, we do fund our forensic accountants uh, through our general funds. We call it, uh, we have a program called Intervention Services. Um, that funding does come from our, um, just our general state only funds, um, but we have this program kind of set aside for um, you know, those extras that come up for protective services for our, our alleged victims. Um, and we do consider forensic accountant uh, accounting um, as part of that protective services, as part of kind of understanding what's going on in this case and being able to advocate uh, as best as possible for that alleged victim and for the financial management for that person. Um, so we um, so far haven't had an issue with funding there. Um, it's again, one of those things that um, kind of ebbs and flows. And at this point, um, our state only funding has been meeting the need for our forensic accountants. Great, thank you. And Carmen. Thank you. Um, Hennepin County, uh, we may have, might have been one of the first few programs that actually contracted with a forensic accounting firm back in 2012. And like Utah, we initially had sought uh, assistance from the senior accountants in our own department to help us. But we quickly learned that their own demand, work demands, you know, when they had to do budgets for the commissioners that took precedence, they had their own um, special assignments to do. And what happened is that we became low priority if we got any help at all. So uh, then we went and we tried to uh, hook on with our, um, our compliance department, the, the big section in the county, because they were doing a request for proposals for um, a forensic accounting firm to help with um, investigations, risk management, digital forensics, etc. And so I was invited to sit in on those interviews and we interviewed six different firms in a competitive process. And the county selected a large Eastern firm um, that was excellent for the big purposes, but not necessarily for our small cases in adult protection services. And back in 2012, we were largely a paper-based organization. And as you know from old times, when you get this evidence, it comes in huge boxes. Today it comes on disks, of course, but back then we didn't have that means to get these documents to a, an accountant. So rather than go with this New York firm, uh, we can't, we've learned about Ide Bailey, which is right down the street from the Hennepin County Government Center. And we were able to transport boxes and boxes of this data and they were able to do high speed scanning. And so we contracted with them then on, a, um, on a personal services contract and that worked out for us. Um, we've had a contract with them for four years now and we are 100% funded by county tax dollars. Great. Thanks, Carmen. Um, let's go on to our, our third and final question for our panelists. So next slide, please. 
Next slide. Looks like it's not moving. Next slide, Tyler. And I will just go ahead and ask the question. Um, so please share a case example where forensic accounting or accountants were used and the outcome. So Carmen, I know that you have a, a particular case in mind. So let's have you start. I do. And, you know, I've selected a case that's fairly familiar to all adult protection services. It's based on an actual case, but I've had to change some of the data to protect uh, the identities of the person. It involves poly victimization of an 83-year-old widow that included financial exploitation, caregiver neglect, and emotional abuse like we see so oftentimes it isn't just financial exploitation. And the successful outcome of this case was based on the close collaboration between adult protection, law enforcement, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, and the work of I. Bailey that performed the forensic analysis. So it all started with a report from a financial investment firm uh, who had an account for this woman. And every month they were authorized to transfer $2,000 out of the investment accounts to her local bank account. And one month, um, this gentleman, I, I shouldn't even call him a gentleman, I guess I'm gonna call him a perpetrator. Uh, she met him at a casino and they had a nine month a nine year relationship, a domestic relationship. And so he lived with her. It was sort of a romance scam in a way too. And um, one month he, he contacted the, the financial investment firm and he asked that all of her money be transferred into an unnamed other account. And he did not have authority to do, and he had authority to, to request transfers, but not to liquidate the account. So the financial firm then contacted the vulnerable adult who did not respond. And they became very concerned because they wanted her consent. And uh, then they, they made a report to our, our hotline, uh, what's Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, um, and made a, a report of financial exploitation of this woman. That report was sent to Adult Protection Services, and we quickly got on that and went out there uh, with law enforcement, uh, with the housing inspectors, because the house was quite a mess, and um, with environmental health. Um, we also, in investigating, when we got out there, um, no one would answer the door and we could see that the perpetrator and the victim were both in there. So local law enforcement then called the sergeant at the police station and got permission to use force to, to enter the home. We got into the house, we were able to interview the vulnerable adult separately. In investigating the case, we had to get uh, numerous medical and bank records and we found out that this woman suffered from diabetes, leukemia, stage three chronic kidney disease, anemia, hypothyroidism. She had had several strokes, which left her with memory impairments. Her husband had died and she received his assets of $700,000 and the house was paid for. Um, now, through the work of the forensic accountant who analyzed 10 years of records, we learned that the perpetrator that she was living with had a serious gambling habit. And going back through all these records with the casino, uh, I Bailey determined he had spent $1,967,532 at the local casino. We also found out that he had spent about $518,000 from the vulnerable adults account, and that records show he didn't make any contributions to her account at all. He had also taken out a $200,000 home loan, which was spent on himself. He failed to pay the property taxes on the home for seven years, which resulted in a debt of 20,000 and the eventual foreclosure and loss of the home that our vulnerable adult owned. Um, adult protection assisted in getting the family involved. Um, we had the vulnerable adult hospitalized because she was ill. Um, one of the things, the family had not seen her for nine years, and that is because the perpetrator, like so many in these adult protection cases, had socially isolated her. He had taken all the mail from her. Anyone who came to knock at the door, like neighbors, he would say, she's sick, she's ill, she can't talk to anybody, she doesn't want to see you. He told the vulnerable adult that her family didn't care about her, the neighbors didn't care, that if anyone saw her, she would be put in a nursing home because they'd see how ill she was. So we had social isolation, we had all forms of um, maltreatment of this vulnerable adult as well. So um, eventually the family was able to hospitalize her because she was ill, uh, put her in a nursing home for rehab. Uh, they became power of attorney and healthcare agents that we didn't have to get a guardianship or conservatorship. And they moved her back um, to a, a town in Northern Minnesota. Now to assist in our financial exploitation investigation, I Bailey prepared a list of questions for us so that we gave them more information that they needed. They also provided us with information we didn't know about, including that he had purchased jewelry, like 
like wedding rings. He was intending to marry her, and we didn't know that either, so we wanted to stop that too. Um, they provided 14 different schedules of summarizing all the debits and credits and all the transactions in chronological order. All the transactions were sorted by category and description. They did an analysis of all the ATM withdrawals, um, all of the casino slot play, it, all sorts of things going back 10 years. So the efforts of adult protection, law enforcement, and the Hennepin County Attorney's Office resulted in the perpetrator's arrest, his criminal charging, he pled guilty because we had hardcore evidence on him, thanks to Ide Bailey. He was convicted for felony theft on two counts, and he was placed in detention. Adult protection substantiated for financial exploitation, caregiver neglect, and emotional abuse. And the perpetrator ended up sentenced to the Commissioner of Corrections for 13 months. He was ordered to serve 180 days in the Hennepin County Adult Corrections Facility, and he was ordered to pay restitution in the amount of $101,000 and placed on probation with the following conditions. No contact with vulnerable adults, no acting in a fiduciary capacity. He had to attend Gamblers Anonymous with verification of his attendance. He had to stay away from gambling establishments. So in summary, although the victim in this case was grievously harmed by the actions of the perpetrator, the protective actions of all helping parties worked effectively to ensure her immediate and future safety. The client was removed to a safe setting in a city in northern Minnesota near her family, who she had been restricted from seeing for nine years. The perpetrator pled guilty. He was prosecuted and convicted to hold him accountable for his actions, and he was ordered to pay restitution. Forensic accounting services helped to play a key role in achieving all of these outcomes, due in large part to the overwhelming evidence that was produced by Ide Bailey that was organized, supplemented, and summarized in court testimony in an understandable manner, because Ide Bailey did serve as an expert witness in that case. Wow, thank you, Carmen. That's that's really impressive. What a what a case. Um, yeah. Stephanie, do you have a do you have a case example you'd like to share? Sure, I do. Um, but I want to say I'm glad Carmen's case um, ended up being prosecuted and criminal charges were filed and uh, the perpetrator uh, serving some time. Um, a lot of the cases we see. In Virginia, and I would say in Virginia as a whole, um, are not prosecuted. I mean, we just can't sometimes get it quite to that level, you know, that Carmen's case was. Uh, a lot of the times, our cases are either major scams and frauds in which the alleged perpetrator is unknown, um, you know, like transnational or international frauds and scams, or we have some power of attorney abuse and mismanagement of funds. And that's what we see a lot of. We're seeing more frauds and scams. Um, we were initially about four years ago seeing the uh, power of attorney abuse. So we have not been able to go the prosecution route. We go more the civil route, um, just because of the nature of some of the cases that we see. So the case example I'm going to give was one of the very first cases in which we used the forensic accountant and we did have a civil outcome. So um, the case was one of my cases and it was a lady in her late 70s who had moderate dementia um, her daughter, who was divorced, and daughter's two children, like one was 16 and the other, I think, was 10 at the time, uh, lived there with mom and basically lived off mom. Um, the husband of, of my client had died. He had, he had to go in a nursing home and he died and then daughter was left um, to take care of mom, there was another daughter who lived in Texas and a son who lived in the same locality, but was kind of distant and hands off. So anyway, she had her daughter and the kids who lived there with her and the daughter really served as mom's caregiver. Um, daughter was not a good money manager at all. She had no income herself, no alimony, no child support, no nothing, no job. Um, and 
she would take out loans in her mother's name. And then, uh, you know, when, when questioned about it, say, oh, no, I didn't do that. You know, you have to push a button, you know, when you go on these loan servicing sites, and uh, it fails me right now, the name of, of one of them. But anyway, you know, she claimed, oh, no, I didn't do that. But you had to push the button to accept the loan, and your mother doesn't use a computer. So, you know, anyway. Um, she denied it, but we knew she did it. Um, she spent $80,000 in one year. Um, she would spend money on vaping at vape shops, cosmetic subscriptions, and Xbox purchases for her sons. There were numerous ATM withdrawals, almost daily. Um, daughter was just really in over her head. Um, we used the forensic accountant to, we obtained over a year's worth of bank records. He examined every last one. He made this enormous spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, listing all the different types of transactions, um, the different types of purchases, added them all up. That's why we know it's 80,000 in one year. So, Anyhow, um, he did that. We contacted the daughter who lived in Texas, and she, I, I'm gonna say she act, I'm not gonna say she was powerless. I'm gonna say she acted powerless um, to do anything about it. And she was very reluctant. And, you know, she made a lot of excuses for her sister and kind of felt sorry for her, I guess. Um, but we at APS petitioned the court to have a conservator uh, from the public guardianship program appointed, and that did happen. So the daughter and the children still live with mom and serve as her caregiver, but daughter has no access to her money whatsoever. Um, daughter and the other daughter in Texas did have power of attorney, but that power of attorney was revoked um, during the, the court hearing. So that is my case. Thanks, Stephanie. And Ariel, do you have a case example that comes to mind? I do. Um, so um, as I mentioned, we use our financial exploitation uh, or our forensic accountants for financial exploitation cases in Washington state that are complex, that have a lot of moving pieces. And one of the times we've used um, our uh, forensic accountant is when we had a, an investigation, we actually had a lot of investigations associated with this, where um, we had individuals who have developmental disabilities who are being served by one um, agency provider, we call them supported living agencies here in Washington state, and their funds were being managed by this agency. And that's fairly typical for this program. I don't know how it works for everybody uh, across the, the country, but it was fairly typical um, business setup for uh, Washington state where this agency would kind of manage the funds for these folks in, in their accounts. But what was um, reported is that this these funds were becoming commingled um, and being used inappropriately. So we had 26 different alleged victims in this case with the same um, alleged perpetrator where this person who was in charge of managing the funds um, was, you know, accessing them for their own personal gain. And as you can imagine, you know, there's just so many moving parts here with 26 different alleged victims, with 26 different incomes, uh, 26 different spending habits, um, that, and, and so on. And we really had to look at whose money was being used um, while it was being commingled. Was really, you know, everybody being exploited or was it specific individuals? Um, and really kind of going through what would be typical spending for an individual um, versus something that might be out of the ordinary or signs that you know, this money's being used by this alleged perpetrator. So it was it was complicated in just accessing all of the documents, um, keeping them keeping them kind of separate, um, but also looking at them as kind of the totality of the situation, um, totality of all the different moving parts with these um, individuals. Um, some of which we determined, you know, through the course of our investigation that no, there was no money missing for that individual. All of their income and, and their spending matches up. 
um, and we were able to close those out without a substantiation. But there were some that did lose money throughout the, you know, throughout this person. So there are, are perpetrators um, time managing their funds. Um, and this person or, or perpetrator, um, you know, was purchasing some vacations that none of the client, none of the alleged victims ever went on. Um, that was for their own personal gain. Um, so our forensic account really helped us navigate that. It was a big, it was a big job for sure. Um, but it definitely, you know, presented us the information we needed to be able to make accurate findings for investigations, to be able to really hold that perpetrator accountable for um, the exploitation that they did do uh, for certain people. And then that report goes into our investigation as evidence and could be used um, throughout the hearing as well of proof that we can prove that this happened to this alleged victim or this victim. Um, and that's why we're moving forward in this case, but not in all of them. And that uh, was, again, a, a really helpful way of utilizing our forensic accountant, um, where this would be a large task and a lot of resources for our investigator to really sit down and navigate 26 different individuals, you know, finances. Our forensic accountant was able to dedicate a good chunk of time to it and provide um, a report that helped us move forward um, with um, putting this perpetrator on our state registry or state abuse registry um, and making sure that they're no longer in that role in their job and not able to have that role in the future with other agencies and not have access to other um, uh, vulnerable adults funds that way. So I thought that was a, a good outcome and just a good example of, again, how these complex cases can come up uh, and a forensic accountant can really help us navigate and build a case uh, that provides, um, you know, accurate outcomes and, and accurate findings for investigations. Great, thank you. Yes, that that is that is complex, definitely. Um, and Tracy, hey, I took a little bit of different approach. On I asked one of our investigators to give a quote about what they thought about forensic accounting. So I'm going to read that in a minute. Um, but I we have a case very similar to Ariel's that we are using our forensic our contracted forensic accounting form as well, which we did go through a competitive process. I don't know if I mentioned that um, went through the state competitive process. It's in an RFP and developed a scope of work. Which if anyone wants to reach out to me, I can share that with you and how we did that. Um, but we have a very similar case where a rep payee for multiple people across multiple counties um, commingled funds, took funds for personal gain, and uh, multiple victims, multiple investigators assigned because they're spread out. And that's a great example, uh, very similar of why we have um, I. Bailey and our contractors involved. Um, there's just so much information, it would be too much for our team to handle. But what I did is I asked one of our investigators, because I thought they could speak on a case better for me, so I asked them to put a quote. So this comes from one of our Salt Lake investigators, and I'm just going to read what she wrote. Um, she stated, this has been an amazing um, asset to us, armed with an audit findings, one, cl one client, her client is currently in the mediation process of, and is expected to recover some of the lost funds. The audits have helped us lead, helped me lead to meaningful collaboration with law enforcement who don't have the ability con to conduct forensic analysis. Um, she states, the results are so encouraging that I believe our agency is more empowered in meeting our goal of ending abuse. I believe that in order to more effectively address the growing issue of exploitation, it's an absolute necessity that we continue this work. I am very grateful to ACL to have the funds that have made this possible to help this outcome for our clients. So I thought that was a great um, statement from her of how it really helped one of her investigations and impeded, and not only helped the client have a successful outcome and go into mediation, but also um, the collaboration that she was able to obtain with law enforcement. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That's wonderful to hear, hear from the field. That's a great idea. Um, okay, excellent. Thank you so much, panel. Let's move on to some questions that have come in. So next slide, please, Tyler. Um, from our um, from our audience. So um, you can go back to questions. Um, so for Carmen, did you say that your staff use ScanWriter? If so, do you have specialized staff who get extra training on the software or who um, are more regularly getting access to software so it stays fresh in their minds? That's a great question. Um, we purchased ScanWriter and we have 16 investigators and we train them all because we want everybody to be cross-trained. It was too complex for us to really um, get a hold of from the four hours of training that come with the purchase of the software. So um, we additionally purchased another four to eight hours of 
individual training for all the staff. It is it is difficult to use to start with, but it uh, it we have some people who like it and some people who don't. So it's actually turning out that we're going to have a few specialists, even though everybody is using the license. So uh, it it it's complex, but it uh, does keep a lot of cases out of having to go to uh, I Bailey. Great, thank you. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Victoria, for asking that question. That's a really good question. Um, so for Tracy, do you share your internal forensic accountant with any other programs, or is she able to work only on APS cases? Our internal forensic accountant only works on APS cases. Great, thank you. As, actually, as does our external, just in case anybody wonders, we do have a criteria that we do have, they have to meet the criteria for APS eligibility of being a vulnerable adult in the state of Utah. So both of the ways we um, look at accounting, we do have to have an open a case. Great, thank you. Um, so one other question about um, educating the community to dispel misconceptions about APS and that it's a program that just places folks in facilities and makes people not want to reach out. Um, would you recommend press releases tied to the outcome of these cases once they're prosecuted? So Carmen in particular, you talked about um, how there was there was a prosecution and um, Ariel and Tracy, I think <laughs> your cases are currently being being investigated. Um, so any thoughts panelists on on any um, on this on this question? Well, this is Carmen, and I will comment on the, I agree with you that we've got to keep people from being fearful of adult protection services. And Hennepin County right now has contracted with NAPSA on the public awareness campaign, and we're trying to develop materials that will make us look more justice oriented, more person centered, and not so scary for people to report to. Um, as a result, we probably won't be talking about cases that we've prosecuted. We'll leave that to, or that we've successfully gotten perpetrators properly prosecuted. <clears throat> That's really the role of law enforcement and of the county attorney's office. And we probably in Hennepin County will stay away from that. Great. Any other panelists want to answer? No. All right. Um, oh, sorry, Krista. Oh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> it took me a second to get off mute. <laughs> it's um, you know, one of the things that's really helped us with that community and dispelling that fear is um, it, and it's hard to dispel the fear with the community in itself, with older adults in themselves, because at least in our state, like 60% of our perpetrators are family. And so there's not only the fear of APS, but there's the fear of the fight, you know, family dynamic and, um, you know, getting a grandchild, getting a child in trouble. Um, and so we're, we're working and doing some education with the same grant that we have on doing some outreach and communicating about reporting and what that looks like and what actually occurs. But one of the things that's really been beneficial to this with our outreach is we are going around in addition and training our law enforcement and we're training our prosecutors. And in particular, our uh, Medicaid control fraud unit has loved having the forensic accounting and it's really increased that collaboration, that working together. And I noticed because of that training and because of that collaboration, it's also helping aid the trauma informed approach and making sure that as we work together, that the, the victims involved, they're empowered in the decision-making, and they're not falling into the gaps between the different agencies, and there's open communication. So overall, while it's hard to quantify that um, from a victim's perspective, I do think it's improving that approach that we take, and, tr and hopefully we'll see some, find a way to measure that to see how we're doing in that area with our victims. Great, thanks, Tracy. And then one last quick question is any, and I and I also recommend um, putting this question on the formula grant listserv. Does any other state um, use accounting software like ScanRider, a different kind of so software? And if so, um, what do you use? So any of our panelists, are you using any other type of software? This is Tracy and our internal auditor also has ScanRider, but we don't use anything else. Great. Anyone else? This is Ariel, and we um, in Washington State, we are still looking uh, for a, a good option for our, our staff. Uh, at this point, we don't have anything uh, specialized for financial um, exploitation cases like ScanRider. Great, thank you.
Um, let's go ahead and go to our next slide. We have come to the end of our time and thank you so much to our panelists at, for your time, your wisdom. I know everybody is incredibly busy right now. So we so appreciate you coming on and, and um, talking with us today. Please, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the TARC there um, up top and follow us on your preferred social media platform. And with that, I want to thank our panelists. I would like to thank our participants for their great questions and their attention. And I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues, uh, Tyler and Andy, for, for being, uh, being back up. And um, we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.